just come my way Wherever I go, hard luck is there to stay Good luck never stays a day A bad luck's always a come my way For today's grim adventure, we find ourselves in Atlanta, Georgia, visiting a terrifying, spooky, scary place known as Netherworld Haunted House. And Baby Gold, what are you doing back there? Boo! At the time of recording this, it is not the Halloween season. In fact, Netherworld, the fine people who are creating the monsters and the sets that scare you every Halloween, are busy creating new nightmares. But they have escape rooms that are open all year round. They're kind enough to walk us through the halls of this place on a personal little behind the scenes tour. Willing victims. You want to know something else? Years ago? Back in the day, like 2013, 2014, sometime like that, many moons ago, I was a scare actor here. I donned the mask. I scared people. It's kind of reliving some sort of childhood trauma. Ah, screw it, it's gonna be fun. Hello, my name is Ben Armstrong, the co-owner of Netherworld Haunted House. We're gonna tour some of Netherworld today, including the escape games, our monster museums. We're gonna see a little bit behind the scenes and see some of the sets from last year. So enjoy this trip with us and the Grim Life Collective. Right now we're in Nosferatu, which is our escape game that's based in the 1890s. This is a game that's uh, more difficult than most because in addition to having group goals, each one of the players has their own individual goal. One of them is actually the vampire's assistant. One of them is actually a werewolf. One is a werewolf hunter. So in addition to all the goals that they have to achieve in this room as a group, they also have to achieve these individual goals, which sometimes run them afoul of all kinds of situations. These candelabras right here are actually from the movie Van Helsing. And you might recognize kind of the stylized uh, nature of them. The Hugh Jackman film from a while back. It's interesting when Universal was building their year-round haunted attraction, uh, in California, they, they, they reached out to me to get these back. I'm like, nope, I'm keeping them. <laughs> now, in the middle there, there's, a, there's an Egyptian stella, and uh, that Egyptian stella was actually part of a throne. There was a cult here in Georgia called the Nuwabian Nation of Moors. They had a giant pyramid and everything. And that Egyptian stella there was, was the back of that throne. A lot of strange things happened there. I don't know the whole story, but uh, that cult is gone now. But it was interesting. So in this, in this game, your goal is to find the lair of the Nosferatu uh, before the time has elapsed, the sun is about to set. And this is actually an escape game. It's not just running out of time. You actually can lose the game if you pierce his heart with the wrong stake. You've got to figure out the right stake. You have to do it in the right time. So it's one of our more challenging games. And with that added element of uh, not knowing who is who and what is what, uh, many crazy things can happen. There's also random uh, scares in the room. Sometimes uh, something will happen that'll shock somebody, you know, a sudden sound or <laughs> something like that. Uh, also, in our games, every game has an avatar, something that speaks to you. In this case, it's a, it's a raven that'll speak to you as the game progresses, that represents the game master. He's probably sleeping now, I don't know. But uh, we can go on to the next one, Haunted. It's right this Let's way. Let's do it. This should be a great time to tell you that we here at the Grim Life Collective love storylines. And the more in depth, the more beautiful it is. So well done on the fr like on this. Well, cool. And you I, got other ones. Well, well, if you love storylines, and I will probably be here for the next seven days, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> We've entered Haunted, another one of our escape games here at Netherworld. In Haunted, you are brought together with members of your family because your relative has passed away. But it turns out he was actually a high-level parapsychologist who in the basement of his decrepit mansion had many trapped entities sealed away, but the worst of them was the night hag. Now, the night hag has haunted your family 
for centuries, and he has trapped this night hag. And now that he's passed away, the night hag can escape from its bonds, unless you, in your remaining time, before the device, of course it's always strangely an hour, <laughs> the containment device <laughs> fails, uh, you're able to send the night hag back to the netherworld. So you're all part of the same family, you're working to discover the secrets of his strange lab. And so you have all these trapped entities. Um, trapped a, entities, you yes, said. Yes, there are all these creatures that are sealed up in here from bits of the netherworld. Here our uh, avatar is this helpful gargoyle who will uh, help us with any problems or puzzles that we might need uh, assistance with. Okay, tell us a little bit about some of these trapped entities. Well, there's... I just heard a strange sound. Uh, <clears throat> this one here is, a, is a, a ghostly entity from the netherworld, but key to him, there is a something, a puzzle on him that matters. Also, some of these, this is more a creature from a Lovecraftian realm. They all have strange pulsings of color and light, and all of these things have meaning in the game. So there's a lot that goes on. And here, here's another strange thing you can see. Oh, it's all decorated with unusual things. This is a, a strange entity full of eyes. So once again, this room is also full of the unknown. You never know when something strange is. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, your storytelling is so engaging. <laughs> <laughs> so, we escape from the first room and we enter into the study. And so, we come into the study, there's that really strange thing here. I gotta show you this. So, a lot of the folks have never seen this. It's called a typewriter. <laughs> and our game masters tell many tales of them You're pulling out the, uh, the ribbon. <laughs> They're begging me to change it, but no, I want to keep this typewriter. But uh, it's always fun when arcane bits of uh, old ephemera, uh, when we get to Sasquatch, we'll see there's a, a cassette player, and people had issues with that. So right now, we've entered Sasquatch. Now this, this is many people's favorite escape game here. There's something about it uh, people really enjoy. And it's very story-driven. Uh, <laughs> in Sasquatch, uh, you're a bunch of campers, you're driving along, and we have uh, these videos that we play for people to kind of set up the story so you know exactly what you're going into. Your car, it, you know, you hit a, hit a log on the road, you call in, the, the people say, oh, oh uh, there's a cabin right up the road, you can head to the cabin, it's nightfall, you're heading to the cabin, you hear weird howls and stuff, you come in, the lights are on, no one's here. You know, you slam the door because something's out there and you're in, now you're in this environment. And uh, so when you do a haunted attraction, you have to spend a lot of time doing the books. So I spend a month or so doing the books and I was listening to lots and lots of Bigfoot podcasts. So I've always been intrigued by anything cryptozoological. I love all that stuff. And uh, so this is based on that world. And so what happens in this game there were two opposing Sasquatch hunters. One of them was like, they're children of the forest, they're friendly, the other one's like, they're evil, savage creatures. You gotta cut off one's head and bring back the evidence for DNA proof. There's like two camps in the Sasquatch world. And so this is based on that whole thing. So you're in this cabin and uh, there's an electric fence and the, the generator is gonna run out in just uh, a brief period of time. Strangely, an hour. And so, <laughs> as that's happening, you've got to unravel what happened, what happened to the missing hunters. But the whole time, these creatures are outside the cabin trying to get in. <laughs> so, yes, it gets, gets very creepy. So, the best part, one of the, this is another strange thing very few people have seen. This is called a cassette tape recorder. <laughs> now, this was so difficult for people to operate, we ultimately had to use an electronic version. But as you move through the store, you find tapes, and you place them in this, and they play back. Oh, wow. It's a very melodramatic voice, me. Uh, it's very much like Evil Dead. The Kandarian demons. No, it's not the Kandarian demons, but they're telling the story of like, oh my god, I did this thing. And you're slowly piecing together, why are these Sasquatch is so angry. 
Oh, this is nice. So, as you know, I was talking about, uh, you know, my interest in cryptozoological, so of course you're bringing the stuff you like, so I'm into tiki, <laughs> so uh, we had to do a tiki escape game. We all love tiki around here. So in this story, uh, you're invited to a tiki party, but you arrive in the early morning, uh, so you arrive at the tiki hut, and uh, you got to find your way in because your host isn't here, but he said, you know, keys under the doormat or something like that. But as you proceed throughout it, what's really interesting in this game is there's a progression of the day. So it starts in the early morning hours, and then as the game proceeds, it turns into a beautiful day. So there's a bunch of things to solve here, but this is based deeply on Polynesian mythology. So let's head on in. So you see here, all of the uh, setup for this tiki bar, of course it's morning, you're in Hawaii, it's great, everything's fun, and uh, you enjoy solving these puzzles, you gotta get to the bar menu, you gotta mix drinks, and it figures everything out as to what happens. There's a radio playing, information from Hawaii, but things get a little creepier as it moves along, as this is the curse of the shark god. This is a battle between Polynesian gods and entities. So what's going on, the shark god of Molokai has taken the idol of the peace god Lono and destroyed it and hurled it all over the place. So you're gathering, kind of like Legends of the Hidden Temple or something, the pieces of this idol to assemble it. And the peace god Lono will keep the peace going, but the shark god of Molokai wants war. So uh, he's trying to build up this massive storm. So at, a huge storm is going to strike this cabin, and as it does, uh, this whole thing is going to get washed into the ocean, and you're going to be devoured by all the sharks. <laughs> so, uh, but you're also assisted by the fire goddess Pele, who appears multiple times and, and helps out with things. So, uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting things, like there's a planchette that you place on the table, and uh, I don't know, I, I could activate it, but uh, oh, here we go. You place these on. <laughs> And it'll move around. <clears throat> oh, okay. What on earth is happening? And then different things will reveal themselves. Boy. You get the next bits of the yeah. puzzle. You know, so it's, it's very involved. The sound and the lighting all correspond to what's happening. And, then, and independent of the puzzle activities is the increasing appearance of the storm. Like this spelled out the word deity and that reference is one of the puzzles and you have to use the, that clue to then solve the next one. Oh. You know, I find myself scared to have my back to something in your, in That's your That's probably your a good idea. <laughs> I would take you in to the cave of the shark god, but I don't think, I think we're going to save that for another adventure. Yeah, save, Maybe, save that one. Like yeah. I got the, the hair on my arms are standing straight up, just walking through the escape rooms, just hearing the story. Can you imagine being like stuck in here for an hour trying to figure all this stuff out? It makes it more challenging when you're, you're working and then suddenly, you know, something's going to happen. So, yeah, like I said, we have the next one we make. Um, I'll, I'll tell you here a little bit, it's a hint, it's a space theme, Ooh. and it is intense. It's going to be the scariest game ever, with every trope imaginable in space. So everything you can imagine, and we have yet another one under development, so we got a lot more fun, scary escape games on the way. Welcome to the House of Creeps. This is Netherworld's Monster Museum. So when you come year-round to visit the escape games, you can go see the House of Creeps. So. There's a lot of interesting things in here, and I'll tell you about a lot of them. Right now we're in an HP Lovecraft room. So here we have characters. These are made by the artist Casey Love. These were seen originally at Monster Palooza. This is from the shadow over Innsmouth. So we see the deep ones coming out of the ocean. They have a little child, and they're fleeing. Of course, you know, we have the, all the, the oceans of, of Innsmouth there off the coast. But there's many other odd things. We have, in this area, we have the Mego brain jars, which you'll remember from the Whisperer in Darkness, where uh, humans were able to travel 
into space, but they had to have their brains removed and placed in these special jars to go with the whispers, who are a strange crust crustacean type creature from the planet Yugga, Pluto. Oh man, I love that Netherworld has this H.P. Lovecraft feel to everything. I feel like I'm walking into an H.P. Lovecraft story. It is, it is, and every year our theme is based on that. Uh, our theme last year was called The Undying Horror, and it's such a Lovecraft theme. Sometimes, you know, we cover all sorts of things in our, in our haunt and in our, you know, sets and things, but we always go back to that cosmic horror that concept that man is insignificant against the powers of the universe. And uh, even though you want to touch on elements of the familiar, we prefer things that are different. I like to say, give them what they want and give them what you want. They like want a that. haunted house, they want scares, they want a chainsaw, but you want to put in things they've never seen before that are memorable, that are something like, what just happened to me? <laughs> Here are many there's a hand of Yiglanak, that's another thing uh, out of the Lovecraft mythos. Not specifically, but many of these are just pieces that you would recognize. That's from the artist Brian Dembski. It's one of his earlier works that uh, it's, it's on, actually on his business cards. Uh, that's by Arturo Balasaro. That's the uh, makeup artist that does all the work for Guillermo del Toro. That's a, a Yeti head from that collection. These pieces, some of these have a lot of haunt history. These witches were sold at Transworld, I want to say 25 years ago, something like that, and only three sets were ever made. And we were lucky to get a hold of one of these and uh, were able to kind of fix it and get it working again. There's a classic piece of haunt history. So yeah, just lots of figures around. Um, this is like a twisted family photo over here. It is. So this was all done by one artist. Uh, this is actually from my collection, and it's I wanted the Universal Monsters, but a different kind of take on it. Uh, just, you know, a, a kind of unique and different take. Um, the creature normally was in my tiki bar, but, uh, you know, not everyone can come to my tiki bar, so I wanted to share it, you know, with the people who visit Netherworld so they could see all this fun stuff. All throughout here, there's there's little bits and pieces. Uh, Whoa! You know, an intriguing thing is in this case, it's on the very bottom down there, is that, that little uh, piece of foot gear. So my friend Randy Bates was one of the people who opened up Pennhurst Asylum originally and uh, got it working and launched. And I said, send me something cool from Pennhurst. So he sent me this little boy's bracket, you know, little <laughs> foot bracket. And we did, back at Old Netherworld, we did a ghost tour, and this was just thrown in a case somewhere in our museum. And I'm, I'm a skeptic, or at least I'm a 40, and I'm interested in the weird, but I'm not necessarily a believer in everything. And uh, we're just going along, and the psychic ghost hunter person was like, I see a little boy over there. And they were like, insistent. And I'm like, they have no way of knowing that that piece is there. <laughs> it was very wild, you know. Uh, that, that little piece happened, but that was from my friend Randy Bates. There's a lot of things. This is a collection of the weird. Uh, this is interesting, it's a cooler casket. And so I'm sure you've encountered these on your travels, but when people had passed away, but they were pre-interred, they would place them in the cooler casket. This had a couple different reasons. One, some air would circulate on the body so it wouldn't get quite as vaporous. Uh, but also, if they were still alive and in a coma, you know, they might have a chance to recover before being interred. So people were never buried in these, so this has probably been used dozens, maybe hundreds of times. Much respect, you know, to those who have died, but it kind of looks like our picnic basket <laughs> when we go to the beach. Just saying. A picnic basket for ghouls. <laughs> this is kind of a fun thing. This is the world's largest shrunken head. Well, who, who knows for sure. This was made by an artist, a uh, really excellent guy uh, from the Shrunken Monkey. And uh, we got this at a tiki convention. He wanted it to be here. But uh, it's interesting. Uh, we kind of worked it out. The size of the head, you know, shrunk down comparatively. If it was an actual shrunken head, this would be a massive giant. So, but it's a really neat piece of art. This case here, these are all pieces from movies. And if you'd like, you can select one of the buttons and press it and see what happens. Jessica, you like buttons. Go ahead and hit yeah. the button. Oh, they have a sleepy hollow one. 
All right, go ahead. That's towards the end. This colonial period figure is from the TV show Sleepy Hollow that ran from 2013 to 2017 and featured a creature-killing Ichabod Crane hunting down and destroying monsters. A bit braver, one might say, than his literary incarnation. Do another! Do the mummy. Do the mummy. It's from the movie The Mummy. Ready? Yeah. This mummy warrior has several parts from the 1999 Brendan Fraser movie The Mummy, and the bodysuit was from the movie The House on Haunted Hill. It was used at another famous haunted attraction before it found its way to Netherworld, the legendary Rocky Point Haunted House. Storyline, scaring people in your escape rooms, but then you also add this level of interactivity. It's, it's fun for people to enjoy coming through this and seeing a bit of all this history. These are the chainsaws that Woody Harrelson used in the original Zombieland. And incidentally, some of Zombieland was shot at our original location of Netherworld. It was the interiors for that. Okay. And uh, we got to help out as zombie coordinators for the actors on that film. This is a stunt puppet from the original Saw movie as well. So this is an original Krampus costume and uh, a gift from a, a friend of ours in Germany. But there's other creatures featured in here. There's Fra perched at the gut slitter, and that was a, a witch. And if you were a, a bad child, she would slit open your belly, take out your intestines, and stuff you with garbage and straw. This is uh, Mary Lou. That's a Welsh New Year's creature. People dress as a, carry a horse head on a stick, and they come to your door and they engage in a game of riddles. And if you lose, you have to invite Mary Lou in and the revelers, and they get to have a party in your house. So it's it's lots of fun. So uh, just bits of the old creepy Christmas. Uh, this is an interesting thing we got recently. This is the squid model from Peter Benchley's The Beast. It was a made-for-TV movie. Uh, you know. Rather than a giant shark, it was a giant squid. And the special effects artist who made this, um, this was picked by American Pickers from his backyard. And uh, that went, was at a uh, museum, or not a museum, at an antique store. And uh, we were able to get it from there. But it's neat. It's got, you know, it's the original silicone. It's got an armature. All the cables are here that would pull all the tentacles originally. So it, it's, you can pick them up. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty heavy. So people uh, coming into the museum, I mean, there's some stuff that's behind glass that they can't touch, but certain things like this, oh, they, yeah. if they wanted to, they yep. can just reach out and... He, oh my God. Yeah, he was here all Halloween season, so uh, you can, you can come take a look tentacles? at him and touch him. That's insane. We're getting here, this is a bit about Netherworld. So these are many of the custom icon characters from Netherworld Haunted House. Um, over the long years. These are uh, silicone creatures made by Bill Johnson, who's an effects artist, who's been working with Netherworld since the very beginning. Who knows, you may have even worn one of these. I don't know. I'm looking, I am yeah. looking. I don't think the mangler's in here because we took them out to use them for another project. But uh, there's a lot of interesting characters, a lot of interesting history. This guy I like, we'll see another version of him later. This is Mr. Grendel. And he had, was from Mr. Grendel's Funhouse of Horror. He was a take on a clown. But what I wanted to do with the clown he was actually an ancient ogre, and he was actually Grendel. And his curved horns were hidden by the leer pipe of a jester. Oh, wow. So that's inside of those, were those horns. And he would get very emaciated, kind of like an it or a Jeepers Creepers type thing. He would, you know, disappear for 50, 100 years, get emaciated, then he'd come out and feast until he was bloated with his twisted carnival. But everything has its own history. This is the Goloth, which is a very Lovecraftian thing, but it was all about that fear of repeating patterns and holes that people have, because people are triggered by that, you know? And of course, this is our fungus witch. Um, back there, that Frankenstein character, uh, that was from our, uh, our show, Leviathan. But the interesting thing, um, we worked with uh, 13th Floor, and the baseline of this character was the character I used to wear for their Don't Be a Monster campaign. And that was a very popular thing for the haunt industry to kind of promote anti-bullying. And so that character was the kind of the template for that, okay. that, that character for Don't Be a Monster. Here we have a lot of, of the big costumes and things from Netherworld. This is our abomination, our ogre. There's the mangler. That was yeah. a costume that you wore once. Yeah, this one right back yeah, here let's in the find, corner. Let's play the mangler for you. 
So this back is The Mangler from Netherworld Haunted House's 2008 show called The Mangler, a genius level surgeon cursed with no emotions and incapable of feeling pain after he was burned alive. The Mangler has wormed his way into many of the haunt's storylines and continues to be one of the most popular icon characters at Netherworld. I remember being down there. It was like towards the end of the haunt. It was down in our dark lower show down in the basement. And I remember the contraption, the metal contraption yep. that was on my arms that I had. And it was so cool. Like, they always tell you, you know, whenever you play monster parts or like, you know, monster movies, when you put on the, the makeup or the mask, you become that character. So there's, all, like I said, a lot of exhibits here, a lot of buttons to push, um, netherworld history, film history, all throughout this. But we're going to take you to some other museums that we have that uh, the public doesn't usually get to see. It's part of a queue line that we have usually when it rains. So we'll go check out what we call the museum queue. So where we are now, we're in the museum queue. And this is a section of Netherworld. In our first year, this was part of our queue line. But uh, I guess during COVID, we started queuing people more outside. And we, but we retained this space. And what we do is we use it for an extended rain queue. So when it rains, you know, this queue line is available. Many of these characters here were in the haunted house, but we're actually renovating it right now. So a lot of the delicates will pull out and stage in these kind of rooms so they don't get smashed around with all the, you know, the more rough props. But these are things that are kind of fabricated for, custom made for Netherworld, you know, by some of our artists. Uh, that was actually a mask from Immortal, but the rest of it was all fabricated by one of our artists. And she did an amazing job. And it was, it was based on a mannequin. Uh, these are some dryad creatures uh once again at one point were there characters like this we have in the haunt? we have characters that uh have been similar to this so uh we did a show i'm trying to remember which one it was i think it was called primal scream a couple of years ago okay it was the last show that we did before we came to this building and in that we had dryad characters because it was sort of nature versus the cthulhu creature so nature earth itself built up to fight this invasion of these otherworldly creatures. So we had a lot of animal type uh, costumes, a lot of plant type costumes. Now these were static figures, but we had dryads uh, that were actresses that were dressed in sort of similar costumes to this. And periodically the dryads will pop back up again, you know, in our storylines or in our themes. Uh, but yeah, there are, uh, you know, there's so many characters, we're creating new ones all the time. Sometimes they're away for a long time, and sometimes we kind of reconfigure them and bring them all back. Oh, man. Now, I don't know if this is translating on camera the way that it is just being here, but we're not in the haunt. No. It is off season. We're just walking through like the main, you know, the building, and I'm a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> We call this guy Dr. Squid. He's really neat um, because the artist created him. Uh, he appears to be levitating from behind, so he, uh, he's, a, he's a really interesting piece. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Now, this is kind of fun. There was a, a haunter in Texas named Lance Pope, and Lance Pope created uh, Verdun Manor and Thrillvania. And he was beloved by the haunt community. He's passed away probably 20 years ago, but they still carry on his legend. And that was a head that he made uh, called the carnivore. And so uh, one of our artists took uh, a body form and, uh, you know, we got a bare body form and we made the rest of the creature for it. <laughs> so yeah, lots of, lots of stuff like that. Um, so these cases, there's combinations of just things we've collected and things that are from films. This is an interesting piece. If you've seen a movie called The Hunger Games, uh, Donald Sutherland was tied to this post to be executed, and then uh, Katniss was gonna shoot him with a bow, and then she went up and shot the other lady at the end. Yeah. So that was the post from that. Um, huh. There's a lot of stuff in this case from different films. Um, the rabbits, that that skeleton from the Micmac burial ground on Pet Cemetery 2. Um, which was filmed not too far from here? Yeah, okay. and it, was, it was a long time ago. Was, those were pieces that Bill Johnson did. This uh, three-headed pig 
apparently was originally in a horror movie I'm not familiar, familiar with, but we got it, it was actually used in the movie The Collection, which is part two of The Collector. Um, this Strode tombstone, we had, uh, that was originally had a different name on it, and, uh, but it, we rented it out to Halloween too, and they put Strode on it, so that was Laurie Strode's uh, tombstone, or, or one of the, the family there. And this was from Eight-Legged Freaks, these pieces, the bodies that were in that, that film as well. Um, that huge uh, metal bulkhead in the back there, that's from the movie Passengers, the Jennifer Lawrence, Chris Pratt. Movie. Oh yeah. yeah. And we're gonna see, uh, we have a lot of uh, scenic elements from that film. And we'll be seeing those pieces from Hunger Games and stuff as we proceed through some of the haunt. You all right, baby girl? I'm losing my mind. <laughs> Do you ever just, I'm gonna go for a walk in the museum. Just <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had the time. You know, it's funny, you know, you're you're always just trying to get the next thing done. We're right. always so busy here trying to get on to the next part of it. Um, so yeah, I don't know, you, you, you forget about it. You know, you, you're, you're just working. This, you know, you, you do what you do. It feels like the rooms, the hallways are endless. Like it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, this is this is a crazy building because uh, our old location was mainly just a giant warehouse. But when we came here, half of the building are office type spaces. So we have huge amounts of room for things like these museums, all of these escape games, gift shops, etc. And our entire upper floor is dedicated. We have fabrication areas. We have uh, offices, and we have all of our backstages upstairs. Oh wow! And we'll see some of that up there. So it, it's a great amount of preparation space and office space that lets us execute what we're doing all in this giant warehouse which features the attractions and some of the interior queuing. Um, a lot of these, this is, a lot of these pieces we got from different places. Uh, uh, this alligator was once in our show downstairs. Uh, we did a show down there called Raw Meat about these cannibals down in the sewers and but there were alligators and things that had grown there but uh, Lots of things. This is another, uh, that's another old piece from Lance Pope. Our collection of bones. I remember this. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously not here. Right. This is, this is interesting. So the legend of the Cyclops came from people finding this sort of thing, which is of course an elephant. But the way an elephant decays, it leaves that spot it appeared to be a single giant eye. And behind you in this case, this is a lot of Netherworld's history here. Um, just things from the long years, from, from some of the early days. That mummy case is from 1997, our very first haunted house we did. This is an interesting, uh, this uh, Wayne Toth, who's a very famous effects artist who came up with stock rounds. This was a, a first year stock round, but we've converted it to be a version of our nether spawn, which is one of our iconic characters. The nether spawn itself sort of represents the actors of Netherworld. And in fact, we call our group of actors the nether spawn. It represents the claws and the fangs and the dark that wait for you. Uh, any number of creatures could be called nether spawn and that's definitely one of them. But yeah, just lots of bits and pieces and characters from the long years. So we're about to go in the haunted attraction, uh, the very first attraction in Netherworld. It was called the Undying Horror last year. So we're gonna see a little bit about the storyline of the show and uh, some of the sets. And then we're gonna pop out, a uh, lot's under construction, so we're only gonna look at a little bit of it. We're gonna see the, the ending of that show. And then we're gonna pop into a couple sections in the second show, which is our science fiction show that was called Parasitic. And after that, we'll go take a brief tour of our casting and mask areas upstairs. We, we have things that time people by time. We also have cameras, but you know, a lot of time in the other world, you're just kind of going in, so. <laughs> right, you just kind of yeah. jump right yeah. in. So that's what we're doing. We're going right on in. Of course, the lights are on, so you can see stuff, but uh, we're gonna go through a dark portion briefly. A 
Netherworld has always started with a, a spinning tunnel because it transports you into the netherworld conceptually. Uh, our spinning tunnel works very well because we have our black lights hidden, but they charge up the dots that are the uh, phosphorescent dots. So it really enhances the effect rather than just having the light spray everywhere. Oh man. Like what on earth? So this is uh, this is Netherworld. Um, this is the first portion of it. So when you're in the main show, you're you're on an actual journey. You start off in the town, the cursed town of Weisberg, and uh, man, it's like Cabot Cove. You don't want to live in Weisberg because people are always dying. I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, we go through a town, and then we go through an extensively massive graveyard. Then we go through a forest, then we enter a mansion, and then we go through the mansion, and then we go through a gateway into the netherworld. So you can actually see portions of that as you look. In the far back there, you can see where the mansion is. Yeah. Um, if you walk this way, you can see the spires of the, uh, of the big church that's there in the graveyard area. But right now, we're in the town. And there's a couple things of interest I wanted to point out. These tentacles coming down from the sky uh, of course, normally you'd see these under show lighting. Uh, this entire area is engaged in a massive storm. So there's oh. lightning and thunder and clouds and we have water mist uh, blasting over you. Then these deep resonant sounds of these massive beasts. And uh, what happens in this story is there's a huge creature at the end of the show. It's like a big glob of flesh. It's called Ubu Safwa. It's, it's like a demiurge, a creator god. And its tentacles are going up from the netherworld and they're descending here. And they're pumping out this goo and they're creating life. So this creature is invading our world by creating all these monsters. Uh, and then uh, so it kind of ties the whole story storyline together. Um, once again, a very not actually Lovecraft, actually Clark Ashton Smith for those snobs about who Ubu Slothal <laughs> is. But anyway, uh, to the haunt portions, uh, there's a zip line here. So we always have like a bat or gargoyle that flies over. You come out of that 40 foot vortex, this thing raises and lowers, it's on a hinge. Aww. So you're very unsteady. And of course you get this big view of everything. Um, we start moving this way into the town of Weisberg. Um, We've had some problems here. You had an airplane crash. Uh, uh, everything's kind of destroyed. There's going to be a lot of big changes in this town next year, as they are every year. But uh, it's, it's kind of having an apocalyptic moment <laughs> right, right, right now is what's happening. And this, this plane was actually from uh, the movie American Made, the Tom Cruise movie about airplanes. So it was part of that set. But we'll kind of walk down through here. So um, you, there's no... Nothing on, right? Nothing's on. Okay. Nothing's on. So Jessica, you should be fine. No That's screaming right. aloud. That's right. <laughs> um, so this floor also moves as we descend. Normally there's air cannons popping off. There's uh, different animatronics happening. That clock tower is spinning and it appears to be on fire. This is like a giant creature we made last year. But um, everywhere in Netherworld are just little simple things like this. Just little pop out. I call these guys gropers because <laughs> move down, their hands kind of flop out at you. Um, so we're coming into the town of Weisberg. You can see here, this is Halloween time. This is a Halloween store, which we're about to demo out for next year. Uh, here we have Dagon, who's sort of a Lovecraftian god. Um, you know, he's kind of messing up the ship over here. We're kind of on the docks area. Um, so we're going to walk through this Halloween store real quick. Um, this was from, we had it a couple years ago when we had our Halloween theme and the whole town was celebrating their, their warped version of Halloween. But Netherworld is constant, like there's animations. In every room there's two or three things happening. Air shots, things moving, things popping out, and there's actors everywhere. Here we have, it's Momo getting changed. That opens up and she screams. Oh, you're right, Jessica, you freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> It's, think, think, everything's fine today, uh, yeah. When we did that too, we had WBAT, the bat. It was the, it was the radio station uh, of the town. But here you see one of, the, one of the other tentacles that's coming down, that's producing a creature here. Uh, 
but we walk up onto this ship. It's all tilted. Um, we walk. This is kind of the bypass to walk under this giant creature here. And you're talking about Lovecraft. This is very much an area that feels like it. This is sort of the esoteric order of Dagon church. And here we have, you know, your, your fisherman, but he's like a, he kind of whaps out and hits you. <laughs> and this serpent comes down and chomps at you. Um, we enter in the interior of this. Oh, wow. Um, there's a giant upside down cockroach that comes flying out. Here we have a crab that's zooming back and forth and pinching his little tentacles. But all throughout you see a lot of things, you know, representing the mythos. Of course, we have a, a, a thing of drawing of Lovecraft. That's a shrine to Nyarl Thotep, uh, who's one of the, the messenger great, of the greater outer gods in Lovecraftian mythology. So at this point, uh, we're going to jump ahead to another section of Netherworld. So this is the control room of Netherworld. Uh, so during the show, uh, staff members will be at these positions and we will monitor what's going on in the attraction. So we're very keen at watching the flow of you know, where people go from room to room. And we're also looking for any problems, we're looking for show flow, we're looking for clogs. So uh, also from here we can monitor all of our alarm equipment, we can turn the show off and on. And this is kind of a fun thing I want to show you. So uh, you can come on over as I demonstrate this object on you. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is what we have inside of Netherworld are called ropers. So haunted houses get to be very busy sometimes. And some people are scared to move forward. Sometimes people are just looking. So a roper is a themed character. It comes up to you and goes, oh, hello, how are you? Here, grab onto this rope. Come on, all right, let's go. And they just pull you, and they will pull you through the haunted house. And all of a sudden, the clog will dispense. So oh, it, wow. it's a, you can let go now. I like that. I know. But it's, it's <laughs> one of the methods we use to keep, even though we're a very highly attended attraction, it lets us continuously move people through and keeping it somewhat themed and interesting. So on a smooth night, no ropers, well average, like how long does it take to go from like uh, entry to exit? Well, probably to get through the main attraction is probably 25 to 30 minutes. Okay. That's uh, good. We exit into the midway and we have this expansive midway where we have lots of food, we have games, we have photo pickups, we have gift shops, we have a massive foam pit you can play in. And then you make your way around what we call the science fiction midway, which is the entry to the second show. Our second show always has a science fiction theme. And so uh, then after you exit that, you visit the midway again, and that, that's the end of your evening. The second show is probably more like a 15 minute show. So you're probably gonna be in attractions probably at least 45 minutes in show, but we also have a lot of lot actors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of actors are entertaining and engaging with you the whole time. That's something in the other world is very well known for, having a lot of lot actors, having icon characters is a big thing. People take photos with the characters. Mm -hmm. There's tons of photo ops. So, you know, we want to scare people. This is a fear-based thing, but the best thing is scare people and they smile and laugh and say, that was awesome. And what I love the most when I read reviews or when people talk is they say, we love Netherworld, you know? And it's like, love? That's a strange descriptor, but that's somehow the effect it has. And I think what it is, you know, people who like creepy stuff, they love this place. And people who only like creepy stuff one time a year will love this place because they like to have that moment. It's that festival thing. It's Halloween. And uh, even people who the rest of the year, it's a normal thing. It's a custom. It's a tradition where they want to come back every year and they want to celebrate and have that moment. And there were the people who they first went on a date at Netherworld and they met here and they come back or there's kids. It's like a rite of passage. I'm old enough. I can finally go to Netherworld, you know, and my big brother's been telling me about it. And it's, it just becomes that tradition and, and it, it's it's so fun that that's uh, that's kind of what it's become what is this place so where we are now we've kind of skipped ahead because a lot of the shows under construction this is an area we call the pre-church ruins but we're, we're in the netherworld itself so we're sort of in a ruined section deep in the netherworld and this is the inhabitant the place where monsters dwell and so in this particular room, there's a lot going on. Uh, of course, up here we have a dragon. And this dragon has an amazing history. It originally came from the 13th gate, uh, which is one of the best haunted houses you will ever see anywhere. And uh, 
we were fortunate that uh, Dwayne wanted to trade it out, so we got it here at Netherworld. But it was actually, the skin was originally made by Cleve Hall, and you guys might remember him, he had a TV show called Monster Man. Yeah. Uh, but that's that dragon. This creature is something we built here at Netherworld that we call the Goloth. And what it is, it was kind of my take on a Shoggoth, which is from Lovecraft's mythology, but a Goloths eat life energy. And this is a giant one. This is from our show Monsters several years back, but it's got 22 different motions. The hands flex and move. And uh, I kind of based the idea, there was a Star Trek cartoon, there was a Tribble Eater. You may remember when you were a kid, and it was this little thing that went over and ate the Tribbles. Yeah. But it was kind of based on that. But uh, the fun thing about it is these animatronic creatures, they break and their skins fall off and they're very violent. So, uh, you know, some of our staff made these pajamas for him. I'm like, I was, put, I was put literally put fabric gonna on it. Like, so what is that? It's, it, so it's a fabric, so it encases the latex, so because it would like throw the tentacles off all the time. Oh. So since uh, she did that, it was a great job. Uh, we didn't, haven't had to replace the skins on them. But there's a lot, there's a lot of pieces here from a lot of places, a lot of great artists that we have. Uh, that's another creature one of our guys made last year. So we'll, we'll go ahead and walk into this area. And there's a lot of views through. Um, also, this table, the sacrificial table here, and uh, some other pieces you'll see. It's, I believe it's from a Netflix movie called Day Shift about vampire hunting, which if you see that show, you'll recognize some of these pieces. Um, coming in here, uh, this is a big rock monster, and it used to be a puppet that would grab people, but now it's animated because during COVID, a lot of our puppets became animatronics. So we'll kind of make our way through. Ho, ho, ho. You can feels good to be inside a haunted house pushing around a corpse again. <laughs> <laughs> Darn corpse. They always hang these corpses in the way. It's such right? a pain. It's like all this decorating and then there's a corpse just mm -hmm. right in the middle of the hallway. I know. It ruins the whole effect. So this is sort of uh, in Netherworld we have an ongoing storyline about the undying. And the undying are a classification of creatures that are not as powerful as the outer creatures like Cthulhu. They're like a blending of those and men. And a couple of years ago when we did Halloween Nightmares, Kamazots, the Aztec bat god, was one of the undying. So we have a lot of bats in this room. This is kind of his area. So this is our representation of, of the bat god. He's up here uh, lording over everything. But there's a lot of other bat creatures around and uh, lots of other pieces that we've collected from a lot of places. This creature back here was another monster that our staff made. And... Uh, it's a kind of a combination of a couple things, but it was uh, called Shono Dingarath, and it was the spawn of two different Lovecraftian creatures. And it's here, like, crushing this bat thing. It was kind of the enemy of it at the time. We call this guy Fingers Bat, because he, he jumps down and he goes, hey, <laughs> like the Fonz, I don't know. But anyway, a lot of stuff happening in this, in this room. Um, a lot of neat things that you can look at, tons of detail. And the whole point is to, if you're immersed in this detail, and you're looking up, you're showing your neck, and that's when they can get you. I like that you have names for some of your, uh, your characters. Oh, uh, it all starts with a story, right? Right. And uh, most of the time, people don't even, the attendees don't even know. I mean, the vast bulk of people are just going to a haunted house to have fun and get scared and to create memories. Uh, but there's, there's super fans that they study it, the mythology, they learn about it. Um, so also for us, it's like a production design. It's like, this is what's happening. So we, with the builders here and, and the artists, we know kind of what we're making. So it, it all kind of fits together. Uh, it's a stretch sometimes, but it kind of fits together. It's perfect. Yeah. Now this is, this is a rocking hall. So the whole hall shifts and moves. And these have been a popular effect uh, back in the old days, but the intriguing thing about our rocking hall is that it's got a curved bottom, so it's like a vortex tunnel, which allows us to have a very low uh, bridge. Normally, if you'd had a cross beam, this thing would have to be up another two or three feet. Okay. But it just is uh, it's like a design thing. So you get in here, and you have the simulation of, uh, you know, messed up gravity and things of that nature. Oh, man. Just everywhere you look, there's something. Stuff. No, no complaints. We have stuff. It's yes, we're hoarders. Proud to admit it. 
Well, yeah, probably the number one most successful <sighs> skill of a haunter is to be a hoarder. You know, they should probably, you know how they have that TV show, yep. Hoarders? Yep. What if they did a show, somebody's going to steal this, of somebody who collects all, like, all haunt stuff, and they call it Gorders. Oh, there you go. There you oh. go. Or they might end up with pumpkins. It's See true. what I did there? Gorders. Yeah, there you go. Good. Yeah. Sounds like goiters. <laughs> a little bit. Um, so this is kind of this is the kind of final room of the oh, first man. show, and this is a Ubu Sathla. This is the big, the tentacles the from the tentacle beginning creature, right? And the tentacles go up and they go go out everywhere. We, we affectionately call him, uh, you know, the meatball. He started originally. I, I envisioned him as a as a giant pineapple with the things coming out, but then we decided to make him fly. So what happens in this room? He's suspended by four different pistons, so he swings around the room like a wrecking ball. Oh, wow. So he will come right up to you and push you up against other things. These other things are jumping out. We have massive subwoofers in here, so the sound is thundering. And the, the light is just, it is so intense in this room, your heartbeat is just, it's overwhelming what you're experiencing when you're in here. And then, of course, there's actors that are dressed as these different creatures that are kind of lurking everywhere, kind of coming out at you. They're thrashing around. They're all independently animated. Uh, there's, we have these worms that are kind of coming out of the wall over here at you. And this, this creature has multiple faces. So, you know, you see him again and again as you proceed through. Oh, wow. He continues to kind of ram into you as he hurls around. And, uh, yeah. And that's kind of the final sequence. At that point, you go out. There's a bunch of other giant monsters you go through, then the chainsaw, and you're out in our medway. But we're going to take a shortcut to the second show, so come with me. All right, so our second attraction is always a science fiction theme. And uh, we're kind of in an area here that's under construction, as you can see. But I wanted to show off this particular piece. So this is a giant robot that we built. And this entire robot uh, is, is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, he moves. Um, he's, he's got an IntelliBeam for a head, so his head spins around and it shoots a light out. Uh, he's got a spinning saw blade, he's got a massive weapon, but this is usually the creature is the first thing that greets you when you come into <laughs> Netherworld. We have another giant robot that we just took down yesterday, but uh, I'm going to show you some of the other bits of this. Now, what you can see all the plants on them, because every year we do a different theme that relates to science fiction. We've done aliens, We've done dinosaurs, we've okay. done cyborgs, dimensional rifts. And this last year, it was called Parasitic. It was about plants and fungus invasion. And it tied into the storylines of Netherworld on the other side, too. So let's go take a look at a couple rooms from Parasitic. So sure. we're about to enter the second show. The first show, you always enter through a massive 40-foot vortex. The second show is this elevator. So let's step onto the elevator. Baby girl, you go ahead. <laughs> and as we go into the elevator, you, you, there randomly is a giant pterodactyl here. Of course, that's standard this time of year because this pterodactyl has been moved from an area. But we're always finding things like that giant squid, you know, that we found. This pterodactyl is fully animatronic. I don't know what his actual origin. He was found at a rock shop up in North Georgia somewhere. So we're gonna we're gonna use him in this year's show prominently as a nice. as a character. So. He just is resting here for a moment. But the elevator, the thing about this elevator that's so cool, first of all, it can hold a lot of people. We could get 20 people in here. But it has a raise and a drop of 16 inches. It's a double airbag system. So we can get air. When it goes up and down, people are like, whoa! It is very intense of an elevator ride. But it's so, so quick because we can put a lot of people in it. You go one door, you're out the other. And this is kind of our, our mechanism to move the people the through. The doors close? They do, completely. Okay. That's right. They seal up just like a regular elevator. Wow. So it's, it's a really cool beginning to the show. So, we begin our walk into Parasitic. It's a miracle, the guys were talking about yesterday, that all of these branches were not ripped down. How is that possible? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, you can see the plant growth kind of infesting everything. In this first room, we have this giant monster who rushes out to attack you. All these mouths are munching, uh, start moving in. We've got a vibrating floor here that rocks up and down. Uh, they did a great job with the scenic here, all this stuff. This is a cool creature. Um, 
The mouth comes in and out like a big worm. It's all, it's on a piston. Wow. And then we turn into this room. And this is a pretty epic room full of some neat stuff. Um, some of these pieces are from films. Like this, we have several pieces from the uh, science fiction movie Passengers. And so that's a piece of, I look at this and you're like, what did that thing cost to create with that level of detail? It, it boggles the imagination. That's actually the star core from Passengers right there. This giant missile uh, we built in house, so it's, it, it resembles a, a massive, basically atomic missile, and it's gonna, it tilts down and drops at you <laughs> like it's gonna crush you. Um, but you can just, this is a spin door, door spins, an actor comes out. Um, this is a fun guy, a fun guy. Fun guy, yeah, yeah. I, I saw but that's, that. But that's actually a, re a Lovecraftian creature called a Gug. It's from the Dreamlands, which is a split-faced, forearm monster. It eats the ghouls that dwell in the Dreamlands. But for this show, it looked like a plant guy, so I stuck him in here. Um, this, this particular thing, this cryo chamber, is from Passengers as well. But the fun thing in this, our netherworld character, the Harvest Man, who is a plant creature, has been captured by this facility. So they were doing work on him, trying to uh, dissect him. And well, things didn't go right, and obviously he kind of grew out and took over the facility. So this is kind of sets the stage for what happens in the rest of the attraction. Um, yeah, we make our way further in. You get some other views of some of these pieces. So these are some flesh walls. And so we have airbags inside of them. They envelop you, that they're breathing. Uh, they've all been kind of done up as plant life. This is a giant slam plate that comes smashing down to create a huge echo on you. So we're sort of coming into another area of this facility. It's called The Box, is the name of the facility, and it has different designations. Um, the particular area that we call the orange section is uh, based on cryptid containment. So here, this is an interesting piece right here. This is one of the tubes from Hunger Games that the tributes were shot up oh, yeah, into, yeah. into the islands. So uh, it's very rare to find a giant lucite tube of that size. Oh, that's, that's like, I'm knocking on this. Mm -hmm. It is pretty, super solid. It could deal. probably hold water in it too. Uh, and that would be a lot of pressure. But like a lot of stuff in here is animated. Um, there's a lot going on in this scene. These robots are animated. This laser is spinning around. There's projections on these windows. I'm not going to lie. I like the wall of, of, of corpses. Yes, they're all, <laughs> all and they're interesting too because, uh, you know, they're all composites that different artists have created. This particular piece you see has a lot of translucency because it's got a lot of things like, you know, plastics in it that you can actually see through. Uh, some of these are parts and pieces from all kinds of different things. There's, in one of our storylines, we inc included the idea of a werewolf because the creatures were able to transform, so they took that bit of the DNA that allowed the transformation. That's why we had a werewolf in that scene. But uh, there, just throughout this place, there's a lot of just really strange creatures that are contained uh, to be experimented on. But in this particular storyline, obviously the plants have overtaken and uh, we'll see a bit more of that in the, in the next areas we're going to go into. It's so easy to... <laughs> yeah. It's so easy to go and, and buy corpses, if you will, for a haunt. But you guys really go above and beyond to, cr to make we things your to, own. We, we do purchase from all of our great vendors, but we absolutely try to use them in different ways or to reskin them or to retheme them. The vast majority of stuff we have is stuff that we've sort of put together. What, one of my favorite things to do is I love to uh, collect like collector masks, really high quality masks, and then use them on a figure and then you know, a mannequin or something and then right. make something or use our icon characters and use them on it. And that, that works out really well uh, to make something that you don't see. You want to have things that people haven't seen anywhere else. Um, and when you go, there's, you know, when you're in a local to an area, you go to a haunted house, you're seeing these amazing things, but if you travel, you see a lot of the similar things. So this is interesting here. So uh, we were on a TV show with distortions called Making Monsters. Okay. And uh, for that, we were on it twice. Uh, one time they created a giant saw blade, but the first they created this giant centipede. And uh, I was so excited to work with Ed Marsha on that because I wanted something that looked like the creature, that, the monster that challenged the world. It was an old 
1950s black and white film with these creatures in the salt and sea. Uh, but anyway, this last year we took our centipede and we mounted it up on a giant steel beam. So now he raises up and moves around. And before you could see him, but the way you saw him, it wasn't as big because he was just kind of head on. This is just a different way to kind of represent how the creature works. So it was, it all kind of tied into our, our plant theming. Um, this is kind of fun here just because it's an actor thing. Um, so the actor in this scene runs around in a circle, but he can run directly at you, but he's not pushing you back because he's on the other side of this. So we call this a reverse roundabout. So they run in a circle. And um, let me see if I can grab these here. <laughs> yep. So we get these uh, tap shoes and we put them on the actors so they run on the steel plate so they're able to make this clattering sound. So it's all about designing that space for the actor and giving them these special tools. It's like clack gloves, but you're yeah. just running and s snapping and bashing around in here. Or you can run back the other way. It works, works either way. This is a fun, fun character. I'm not gonna say fun guy again. Um, so this is a creature we fabricated it's based on the elder things from H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness. The starfish-headed creatures that created the Shoggoths. Uh, that film that Del Toro is desperate to make one day. Um, but anyway, it's, it's been in our show for a couple of years. But everyone keeps thinking it's a plant, so I stuck it in this show. It's not really a plant, but, you know, it'll, it's acting as a plant today. So it, it kind of works out. Welcome to the backstage of Netherworld Haunted House. So we're going to look around at some of the areas where the actors get prepared every night. Uh, now, Netherworld has tons of actors and tons of other staff. Our operations staff is all downstairs, but up here is where the actors get ready. So first off, I'm going to show you, we're going to walk into this little room. This is where casting occurs. Just to give you an idea, this is what it looked like on the last night of the season. So these are the actors that are located in the first attraction. And we also have all the leads. We have the lot actors. And on this wall over here, you'll see the actors that are in the second attraction. Uh, we give people cards that represent their position. So they'll take that card and they'll take it to the different departments to get their equipment. They're going to get masks, they're going to get costumes, they're going to get stuff from the armory, they're going to get props, they're going to go to makeup, all depending on what's on this card. And you can see here, of course, we take photos of all the folks so that we know their name. We also change the backgrounds depending on, you know, what, what year they've been here so we know if it's an experienced actor or not. So we have a lot of, after 26 years, we have a lot of systems in place to kind of really get the crew rolling. So uh, we're going to come out here now and I'm going to show you a little bit about around this room briefly. This side down here, this is all costuming. This side is armory. Armory are the big suits that is, is a complete suit. On this section, it's all closed up right now, but this is where our makeup room and hair departments are located. We're going to go take a look at the mask rooms. So we'll come right this way. <laughs> so this is our secondary mask room. This is primarily where we keep our silicone masks. We have a lot more silicone masks that are not on display and some that are needing repair. Now, those of you in the haunt industry will recognize many vendors, but there's also a lot of things here that are absolutely custom to Netherworld. Like as we're looking around, for example, this mutant this custom created. This was custom created. Um, that's a basement effects there. That's custom to Netherworld. That mushroom witch is custom. Um, there's just a lot of things in there. A lot of great pieces from Immortal. That's for basement effects. You'll see your CFX masks here. This was a version of the Gorgon created by Bill Johnson uh, for our show, Night of the Gorgon. A clever idea having the snakes come up and go down in this way. A really creepy looking creature. Uh, this is a creature here based upon the, the fear of, we saw a version of it down below, a fear of a repeating pattern. You see all the teeth and holes in this character. But uh, these icon, some of the icon characters, they go out a lot. Uh, some, some are stored here, but it's a, it's a big difference of that. You know, some nights we need them, some nights we don't. And some are just stored, but a lot of these masks get used. We use a ton of masks at Netherworld. We just, 
we really like the monsters, but we also do a lot of makeup as well. There's, there's more, here's some of the hands laid out and a lot of the other, there's the collector. That's our primary icon character. In other words, we have many versions of this mask, depending on the actor. But it's a foam mask, not silicone. So it's very comfortable to wear. But the collector is sort of our Mickey Mouse, if you will. Um, you, there's a, other custom things up here. Like we had a bunch of these done for our, our dinosaur show, Cold Blooded. We have some of these Krampus demons that were made by an artist, Jonathan Thornton. There's a couple of 3D leftovers from a 3D show we did a couple of years ago. But let's look at the primary mask room. So this is the main mask room. Uh, oh, I love uh, the smell. Yeah, oh gosh, <laughs> that smell. Uh, you can see here just tons of masks. So a lot of these are ones that we may have purchased. A lot of these are ones we may have fabricated. Uh, some may be familiar, some are not. We make a lot of sock masks, and sock masks are a good alternative to uh, silicones. Silicones are great because they can be easily shared you know, because they can be cleaned. The sock masks aren't easy to clean, but incredibly comfortable. But, for example, sock masks, you, you take a, a prosthetic, you glue it to a stocking, you build it up, and an individual actor will have that. And we have an entire mask crew, and you come here and they, they fit the actors to the mask. Ergonomics are super important, because if you're not comfortable in the mask, you can't perform as that creature. The same thing with your makeup, the same thing with your costume. So uh, there's a lot that goes into getting that actor fit. It's just like training the actor, you know, making sure they're comfortable in the outfit. There's a lot of weird plant things here because we had a plant show last year. You see some mushrooms, you see some fungi here. Some of these were custom pieces that we had. But, uh, you know, a lot of these will get cycled out and we'll have a new crop of characters for, for this coming year. So I'm going to show you a couple more things that are kind of neat. Over here is an example of some of the monster suits at Netherworld. So all these suits were fabricated in-house. Uh, this particular one was our icon character last year. He was a survivor who was going down there to battle these monsters. And uh, Anton Varla was his name. And he went down there, and you could see the scars of all the suckers and the beasts that had been pounding on him. And this one's based on football pads, so it really builds the actor up. This is one of our primordial guardians. This is from uh, our show Primal Scream a couple years ago, so it had that very, you know, crazy animalistic look. This was the armor for the Goloth. You see all the fear, fear of repeating holes oh, wow, all yeah. throughout that. And this was another, this was one of our berserkers from two years ago, Rise of the Nether Spawn, these savage warrior creatures. So, in addition to the masks, we have these base, huge built up suits and props to really make these monsters happen. And so, the last thing I want to show you is this, because this is kind of fun. So this is what we call the Column of Destiny. So it's a tradition here at Netherworld. Every night before we open the show, we choose one of the staff to hammer the nail. And so uh, these represent different years. There's one nail for each of, of, the, of the different years we have here. So we've just completed our, our fifth year down here. And so we'll, we'll select them, they'll come out here, everyone will gather, they'll chant, they'll grab this hammer, they'll try to hammer it in, the nail goes flying, you know, they smash their fingers, what's going to happen? And so it's, it's very exciting, it's a big pump up. And then it's the continuation of a piece of history you're a part of as you, as you do this. So we've got another three years on this thing, and then I don't know, I'll have to get another one. But uh, it's, it's a big fun thing we do in Netherworld. So anyway... Thank you guys for coming, um, everyone who's watching and the Grim Life Collective who, who came to see us uh, here at Netherworld and uh, we wish you many other spooky adventures. The Mangler. My time here at Netherworld back in, I think it was like 2013 or 2014, I'm not entirely sure. That's it's been a check. minute. I played a couple different characters here in Netherworld and I actually got to wear the Mangler mask and I got to scare Slash. It, that was a big deal for me. I mean, come on. And uh, you guys, I would say dug this up because it is like, you know, like spooky. Mm -hmm. But uh, this exact mask. That's right. Yeah, this is one of our, next to the collector, probably our most popular icon character. So the Mangler, he's seen in different places. Um, sometimes we make him into an animatronic. Sometimes he's a static prop. Sometimes he's an actor in the shows. Lately, he walks around out in the midway. 
and um, yep. Now, we, we tried finding the, the contraption that he wears, and of course I'm gonna put a picture of me actually wearing this way back then, but we couldn't find it, but this is perfect. And it's bringing back a lot of memories mm -hmm. because working at Netherworld, it was my first time ever putting masks on like this. Really? And I, I remember it might have been Jessica or somebody else saying, hey, have you ever worn this before? And I, I think I might have lied. I was like, yeah. I've sure I did, it. yeah. I, I wear them every to. day. I rob and, banks. I'm great. And I remember the warning. They said, if you start feeling claustrophobic, just let us know. And I was like, well, what am I getting myself into? And you put it on and it just suction cups to your face. And when you're scaring people all night long, you're sweating and it just goes even more. And it was an experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're welcome. And uh, thanks for acting at Netherworld. You'll forever be one of the Nether Spawn. And uh, thanks for coming back and uh, showing off what we got to all these fine people. Wherever I come, I've had luck. It's coming my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. Is that it stay? Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's always coming my way.